Welcome, Nikki. Um, we followed your work for a long time and are excited to hear from you. Thanks. Great. I'm really pleased to, to be part of this event. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I've, I've learned loads over the past couple of days and I hope that continues today too. Um, so yeah, uh, Matt and Debbie asked me to talk about uh, Echinopsis, uh, the toolkit that, that my colleague Eve Lucas and I have been have been working on. And I'm going to do a quick overview of the of the tool itself and primarily the design principles behind it because I think they they kind of overlap with the the way that your building taxon works quite well. So a bit of context about me then is uh, my background is as a software developer and I transitioned from software development into research. And uh, I'm interested really in how we can use software development practices in research. I still retain a, a big interest there. So these are things like automation. So that, um, routine processes are, are easily repeatable and, and scriptable. That we do version control. Um, primarily in my career, that has been on code, but we're applying version control now more to, to data and the, and the pipelines that, that, we, that we apply to data. And also to the products that we build from data. So things like the drafts of articles, um, we can we can really make ourselves much more efficient if we if we apply tools to help us deal with that rather than emailing around many many uh, versions of Word documents with final version dependent on the end. Um, another another aspect of that is dependency management. So if we can properly products out of our out of our data, then we know that. If we have an article which contains a chart, which is built from an analysis program, which applies itself to a piece of data, if that data gets refreshed, then the things downstream of it are stale and need to be refreshed. And dependency management in software development has a, a nice set of tools that can help you deal with that. And I found that really useful when I'm when I'm writing uh, research papers with colleagues that we can that we can see all downstream products that are built from a data set. And things like continuous integration, and we've heard a little bit about that in this uh, in this event today. Um, so, where we can use things like uh, the actions framework in in GitHub to run a whole set of steps uh, when a, when an action is triggered. So we can pull data sets together and build things off of them. We can pull pull data sets together and and build things like the static sites and taxon pages off of them too. So institutionally at Q, we've got this commitment to use digital technologies to accelerate the process of taxonomy. And we're thinking about that, not only in the tools that we build, but the way that we build them. So, so trying to use these practices there. So looking up uh, a little bit wider then, um, we're trying to build uh, in, uh, across the biodiversity informatics community, this, this idea of the digital extended specimen, which is a really big and lofty aim. So integrating specimens and their associated data right across multiple research infrastructures. And uh, to get there, the, we're gonna have to have activities at a, at a big range of scales. So there'll be large scale um, efforts, things like we've got the DISCO program in Europe. Uh, you guys in the States have got IDIBio and, and globally we've got GBIF where they're operating on really large corpuses of data. But I think also there's a role for, for individual researchers to, to test out some of these approaches with lightweight tools and with the idea that that could give them a, um, a much more informed voice that can that can help drive the direction of these these larger uh, larger scale initiatives, and that's what I'm going to focus on here. Um, we built a product that's based around uh, a software tool called Obsidian, which is a personal knowledge manager, and it's it's uh, it's something that's been designed to help you create and link research notes. Uh, it's kind of a desktop equivalent of some some of the products that you might know, like like Evernote and so on, where moving your notes from from paper to to digital and and helping you you link up notes and photographs and and references and so on. It really emphasises linking, but a crucial thing is that it stores its data locally and it uses open formats. Uh, if any of you have followed Evernote's evolution over the past few years, you, you'll know that it's been bought a couple of times, so. So the fact that a software product can be bought can, can cause some inhibition among, amongst the users of it. If you can store the data locally, you can be confident that your data is going to be there for the long term. And it stores data locally in, in, a, 
in a format called Markdown. And we've, we've covered that in, in some of the talks up till now in, in TaxonWorks. So it's a simple structure for files um, to style the data, style the text within, within the file, and to make simple links between different files. And you can have a bit of structured data formatter in there as well. Coupled with local data storage is that it works offline. You've got an extensible architecture and you've got a really active user and developer community. And these are attributes that are shared with OpenRefine. Um, I guess a lot of you are familiar with OpenRefine. It's a generic program for cleaning and linking tabular data. And we've adopted it in biodiversity informatics uh, with some success, I would say. Really, we want to see with this project if we can affect the same kind of step change in the management of semi-structured uh, note and research data that we've been able to do with tabular data and OpenRefine. So in a nutshell, we've extended Obsidian for specimen research. We've built some simple plugins that allow people to access specimens from GBIF, uh, names from the International Plant Names Index. Obviously, as I work at Q, uh, my focus is, is botany. Um, collection profiles from, from GeoCycle, from, from GBIF, people profiles from Bionomia and literature from Crossref. You can link up this data, explore it spatially on a, on a map and in a network visualization. And you can start to use this to cite these elements when you write new work. So really, the idea is that you're learning open science working practices. This is key. We know that people's time is really valuable and they don't have much of it. If you, if you need to develop skills to, to work with this program, we're really trying to make sure that those skills are things that are going to be useful in other projects um, that you might use in your future career or, or other initiatives. So we don't ever want to send you down a rabbit hole where we're asking you to develop a skill that's only going to be useful for us. We want to make sure that the things that you learn are going to be generic skills that will, that will help you in your career more widely. This is a quick overview of, of what the system looks like when you download it. So it's got a start page. And this should show you that you can scroll down and find a scientific plant name within a page, send it off as a search to ITNI, get a search result back and pull a page back, which is uh, the name from ITNI. It's showing you there's structured front matter for the, for the page. And we've got type data there. So we're highlighting the type data and sending that as a search to GBIF. Is pulled a GBIF record back. And part of the GBIF record is the, the associated media. And you've got that in a zoomable form here. So you pull back a name and the type specimen. One of the pieces of data that GBIF give you is the, uh, the collection in which the, in which the specimen is housed. So similarly here it's being highlighted, uh, sent off as a search to GR cycle and an institution code this is coming back and we're picking the institution code. And we made an institutional profile there. We know that the collecting event was done by a person. So we're sending the person name into Bionomia. We should get a list of Bionomia results back. And then we pick the person profile. So now we've got all the, all the different ways that that person's name is, has been recorded. Um, now we've got those elements in the system, it's scanning through all the text in the system and it's finding places where you could link those data up. It's next going to show that uh, one of the other kind of data that you can link is it's going to going to look up for the bibliographic data, the reference from Crossref. And it's pulled that data back too. So we've got, a, we've got a piece of data which represents the reference and all that's getting linked up. As well as just the text files that we've created there, um, I connect this to my PDF library. So you can view PDFs from within the system, but also you can search across the markdown documents that you create and the content in PDFs. So you can have quite, quite, um, quite a rich set of resources to support your research built in one place. Everything I've shown up till now has been about um, data that's been published already. But if you're using this to create data that you want to you publish as new research, then here we've used a template that, that has a kind of a, the article sections that, that you would want to author. And one of those is species ex specimens examined. 
and you can search through the specimens that you're storing in your system and drag a specimen reference into the specimens examine section. So this is uh, you're building here a markdown document that we could that we could process into a nicer looking PDF at the end with with true specimen references embedded within it. The last thing to show is just what we've done in these past couple of minutes here is we pull back a, a specimen record from GBIF and we've extended it with all these extra pieces of information, the person that did the collection, the institution in which it's housed, the name for which it is a type, um, the publication in which that nomenclature event was published and how we're using that, uh, that specimen in, in new work. So we have kind of built a digital extended specimen in, in just a few, few hops there. The next uh, thing I can show is um, thinking about how we can replicate some of the things that people do in the physical work and environment in a digital one. So um, I, I was really happy after COVID to come back to work because I, I find it really inspiring to watch people work with specimens and lay them out on these kind of benches like you see here in the Cougar Berry. And I think where we've, we've lacked up to date up to date is we haven't been able to replicate this kind of working environment in the digital environment. So this next uh, little video is going to show how we can maybe lay out some specimens in a, in a whiteboard type environment to, to help people um, compare them. So this is a, a system that's had a few specimen references pulled into it. And you can see the users highlighting some on the left hand side. And they're dragging them onto this whiteboard interface. And again, it's going off to GBIF and, and getting those specimen uh, images. and you're getting a, basically a little card for each, each specimen. And then you can drag them around to, to form your theory or to represent the theory that, that someone else has already published. And this probably is a, a nice place where we could plug in AI approaches so we could send all these data off to a, to a cluster and algorithm and, and lay them out according to that cluster and algorithm. About three minutes left. Cool. So as a roadmap then, We've built this kind of personal research environment based on markdown uh, authoring and linking. And we're now working on seeding them. So we're trying to pre-populate it with data. So we make you a template on GBIF, on uh, on GitHub. You'd, you'd set the context in which you're interested in and we'd, we'd pull all the data together so you had a pre-populated environment rather than you having to populate it yourself. We're interested in working on web publication using static site generators. And this is where we see it overlapping with the, the work on taxon pages that we heard yesterday and producing research outputs from this. So building documents and building data sets out at the end and integrating this data with, with uh, OpenRefine. We see that those two generic packages can work really well together when we when we augment them with um, specialist services that, that access the kind of data that biodiversity and informatics researchers need. Uh, I'll end with a couple of uh, nice, interesting pieces of work that people have done with it. So I was really pleased to get an email from a colleague at Botanic Garden Edinburgh at the end of the summer, and someone spent their MSc project working on different, uh, evaluating different curation methods and did a large proportion of their work in, in Echinopsis, um, completely without my inv involvement or, or knowledge, um, which is testament to the, to the support of the community that Obsidian gives you. They're a really big and, and supportive community and how well documented it, it is, that, uh, that by which I mean Obsidian, not, not Echinopsis necessarily. Uh, she was able to pick it up and run with it. And, and as, a, as someone who's been involved in software development, that's, that's exactly what you want to see. I was really, really pleased to see that. Uh, Edinburgh and, and the team at Q are going to be working on helping um, the MSc programs that we run, uh, starting people off using these kind of things because they're going to be valuable tools for their future careers. Uh, just recently, um, uh, this guy Anton has, has put up a version of Taxonomic Literature 2, which is a, a really key work in botany. And he's done this as an Obsidian uh, vault. So it's a, it's a whole set of Markdown documents, which are, which are super hyperlinked to, um, to collection profiles and person profiles. This is a really, really useful work, and it's really nice to see someone using, using the, the system in this way. Um, so I really recommend you, you watch what, what, what he does in the future. And he's got some really interesting ideas. We're at time. Um, I've got a couple of pleas for things that I would like, but I can leave them to the to a later discussion uh, section if you, if you like. 
Mm-hmm. Matt, you want to make the call? Um, just go. <laughs> let's do one more minute, Nikki. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. So the, the things that I would like are, um, uh, and if anyone was at, at Tabrig the other week, you'll see that it was one of my questions at loads of talks is that we could really try as a community to, to support the reconciliation service API. I showed that I was highlighting pieces of text and sending them as, as queries to, to different resources. I'd love for that to always be a reconciliation service call. Then we could make a plugin for Obsidian that is just a reconciliation service plugin. And anyone can use it for anything. And, th- and that would be really powerful, not just for biodiversity informatics, for people doing digital humanities research, all kinds of things. That's plea one. Plea two is we, we do something like Entity Exploder. Um, this is a plugin that you get for a browser picks up an entity, sends it to Wikidata, and you get the whole graph of different things that are, that are related to that identifier bank. Um, I'd love to see Obsidian have a thing like this. And I'd love to see the um, things that we put up in taxon pages or, or other publication environments support this kind of this kind of uh, navigation into, into the network of linked entities. Then my two, please. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nikki. Very briefly, can you, um, if you have a link to a blog or somewhere where we could follow, where's the best place to follow you and your ideas? If if you want to share something like that, please feel free in the chat. Uh, yeah, I've got all... some links. I'll put them in. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. Uh, the the uh, gears are, are swimming in my head already. So thanks so much for sharing it. Um, in my mind, we're looking at the future here of of how we develop skills and use tools in the future. So yes, uh, wonderful stuff. Okay, without further ado, there will be questions. I also noted that I have some questions and Debbie, I can't answer ask them in the Q&A. So I'll put some questions in the, in the- Google Doc when we yep. find time. Yep. So uh, Nikki, please, a chat GPT, all of the hotness talk here. So Michael, take it away, please. So the title is Using Chat GPT with Confidence for Biodiversity-Related Information Tasks. Purposefully very vague. Um, so to start out, I'm just wondering if I could conduct a little poll here. Have you used G- Chat GPT? Um, and there's a little asterisk. By this, I mean any language models like Google's BARD or Microsoft's Bing Chat or your own offline models, if you're brave. Um, yeah, so if you could put a one, if you've never used it, two, if you have, and a three, if you have used it, and with bonus points, you've used the API um, to automate the use of ChatGPT. All right, yeah, a lot of twos, but we do have some ones. So, and a three, we have a three. All right, bonus points to you, Kim. (laughs) All right, thanks so much. Uh, Moving on. So here's an example of ChatGPT. So to explain for, for the ones in the chat, um, ChatGPT is an online service that, I mean, you might also already know what it is, but forgive me um, <laughs> if you do. Because so ChatGPT is an online service that you can talk to as if you're having a conversation with an actual person um, and you interface through it with natural language. So it's as if you're texting somebody um, and they'll text right back. And that person that you're texting is very, very smart, sometimes not very wise, but usually very smart. <laughs> so here at the top, you can see I asked um, Chad GPT, what plant species can I find in Gainesville, Florida? And it gave me a big, long response. And inside the response, it lists a bunch of species. So by their common names, like live oak, Spanish moss. And then it also gives their scientific names, such as Quercus virginiana, or I'm not going to try that one. Um, and then <laughs> it also tries to describe each species that it told me about. So what being a, a data person and trying to automate things with computers, I wanted to know, can, can chat GPT give me this information, but in a structured format that I can pass to some data analysis um, script or workflow? If so I asked it, reformat this list in TSV using Darwin core terms. So TSV is what you see here at tab separated values in Darwin core, of course. Um, helps us describe species occurrences, among other things. And it did exactly that. So this first row, you can see it it chose to use the terms scientific name, vernacular name, and location. And then in the following rows, each row represents the claimed occurrence of a species in Gainesville, Florida. So it gives the scientific name, 
the vernacular name and the location. And it does this for every single species um, it told me about. You can see the full conversation at this link. Um, and I'm sure you'll, you'll have the slides later to actually click on things if you'd like. <laughs> so I see the spelling in the chat there. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, a, yeah, not a biodiversity person myself. <laughs> um, so this may be wonder though, can we mine large language models like chat GPT for biodiversity data? Um, they have all this information. Can we actually turn it into useful data? And the reason why this is so appealing is first off, um, large language models like chat GPT, they're trained on essentially everything on the internet or all the text on the internet. Um, sometimes behind paywalls, sometimes not. Sometimes it's scientific text, sometimes it's non-scientific text. Um, so it has all of this information and it's aggregating it all somehow and processing it somehow. So it has a ton of information. Um, we also have in science communities, we have we have curated data sets. So I'm funded by Edic Bio. They, they share tons and tons of species occurrence data sets on the internet. Um, but there's a gap. There's a gap between these curated data sets and the knowledge that is buried in text um, across the internet. Um, yeah, if, if you go to IDIG Bio and, and you know a particular species, I'm sure you can find something where IDIG Bio doesn't have a lot of data for the species, um, but you might have a text reference that says, this is where the species lives and occurs and everything. So there's a, a knowledge gap there. Can LLMs help fill this gap? There's a problem though, and that's LLMs sometimes make up information. And sorry, if I didn't explain, LLM stands for large language model. It's just a generic way of referring to things like chat GPT. So yeah, LLMs sometimes make up information. This is called hallucination, and it's a problem. Um, we want them to tell the truth. We don't want them to lie. So <laughs> we wonder, how do we know when we can trust these language models? Our proposed solution is to first evaluate the LLM to see when is it lying and try to measure that and a confidence model to predict when it's making mistakes or lying or whatever you want to call it. Our specific application was using chat GPT to predict species occurrences with high confidence. So to formulate it a little, given a species in the location, we want chat GPT to predict whether the species is present or absent at the location. So more succinctly, we have given a species and a location, we want ChatGPT to say it's present or absent in location. And this can be rephrased as a yes or no question to actually pose a natural language question to ChatGPT. So for example, does Macropus rufus naturally occur in Gainesville, Florida? And it said no. And I should note that this name is outdated. Um, Macropus rufus is no longer the, <laughs> the accepted name for the red kangaroo, as was pointed out to me a couple of weeks ago. But I blame Google for that mistake. <laughs> um, and to automate things a little bit, you can, you can submit questions to ChatGPT using the web API, which is just a way of automating your interaction with ChatGPT. So our first step was to compile a labeled test data set. So here we're trying to understand ChatGPT's performance, how well it can actually answer these information-based tasks or questions that we pose to it. So we collected a bunch of records using the IDBio API. We collected 10,000 plant animalia and fungi records. Um, and we tried to get a decent spread across all the phyla available through IDBio. There is a problem with this though, and that's that IDBio's occurrence records are largely presence only. So they tell us where things are, but not where they are not. Um, the ChatGPT could trivially get really good performance if it just said yes to every single question, if it was presence only questions. So we also needed to test it on things where it should be expected to say no. So we called that a synthetic data set of pseudo absences. And to do this, we just took the 10,000 records that we had, we randomized their locations, and then we removed anything that were actual occurrence locations recorded in the bio. So this, the, the logic being, if we take a species and we take a random point in the earth, um, there's a, a decent chance that it does not exist at that location. So we call these pseudo absences because we can't confirm them, but they give us something to um, test ChatGPT's ability to say no, something does not exist. The second step was to actually submit the questions to ChatGPT and grade its answers. So as I said before, we can construct natural language yes or no questions, um, and we can do it straight from Darwin Core Records. So 
looking at a snippet of a Darwin core record, we have a scientific name, and then we have some location information, such as country, state, province, and county. And then we just turn this into a question. So does this species naturally occur in this location, yes or no? And then we submit it to JetGPT. If it says yes for a presence record, we say you're right. If it says no for a pseudo absence record, we say you're right. Um, if it gets those answers wrong, we say you're wrong. And if it doesn't say something, if it says something other than yes or no, we interpret it as saying, I don't know. Um, ChatGPT is a little bit hard to control. Sometimes it says things that you don't want it to say. Um, <laughs> so we just interpret any other responses as it's saying, I don't know. And the third step is to grade um, the responses and train, I mean, sorry, use the graded responses to train a confidence model. So based on its performance on these questions, sometimes it was right, sometimes it was wrong. We want to be able to predict when was it right, when was it wrong for, for future questions. So our last talk in this first session is from Tommy McElrath. He's the insect curator here at the INHS. And he was, just as a side note, he is the person to ask for an honest assessment of digitization in taxon works. Uh, he'll give you the pros and the cons and the dirty uh, information in the background. Tommy, please. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. This is going to be a very different um, perspective. Um, so I I'm a collections manager here at the Illinois Natural History Survey. I am primarily a user of uh, software. I am not a developer in other than in, I in terms of ideas. Um, and so my my perspectives here are all from a user's perspective. Um, so I, I wanted to ask this question, and this actually is uh, sort of an update on a talk I gave at Spinach uh, this last year. Um, I wanted to ask the question, um, how quickly can new accessions, new specimens generate citations of a collection? Um, but before I even answer that question, I'm going to talk about ecosystems. And I'll talk about them a little bit differently um, than you might have heard of before. I'm going to talk about the digital data ecosystem. Um, so I'd like to envision this as a watershed where uh, specimens and their digital data are water droplets that go to uh, down a series of rivers uh, or a, a watershed and kind of go into a, a lake, um, which then has an outlet, which eventually goes to aggregators. Um, and I'll talk really quickly about our ecosystem. Um, just in the INHS insect collection here in Champaign, Illinois, we have uh, about 1.1 million digitized collection objects um, representing 2.7 plus million specimens. And um, that's just what's digitized. We have over 7 million specimens. Um, these have been digitized for the past, uh, we've been digitizing for the past 30 years almost, um, ever since, since about the early 90s. Um, that's at least how our, our data uh, says that's how long we've been digitizing. It might be slightly longer than that. Um, we have many, many images in our Taxon Works database. This is actually a picture from Taxon Works. Um, and I'd like to talk about where the bottlenecks or where the where the issues come up when we're talking about getting that water quickly from the mountains or the smaller streams or tributaries, uh, both into the INHS insect collection and then out to aggregators. So first of these bottlenecks is uh, came up first when I uh, received a large accession from this paper, um, which was done by an ecologist here at the University of Illinois. Um, and they actually handed me over uh, a couple thousand specimens with a Darwin Core formatted um, a data set, uh, in, and I couldn't import it into Taxon Works. Uh, this was a few years ago. And so I sat with these specimens for multi years uh, as Taxon Works was developed. Um, and uh, a number of tools have since come about since that happened. So, first off, um, we had uh, an amazing tool developed in Taxon Works that helped us digitize and import a whole bunch of our slide specimens. We had um, a lot of updates to this uh, staged image parser, um, uh, as well as filtering those staged images. This was a result of a number of different grants that we had worked on. Um, these images were a result, result of a bunch of those different grants. So these images were finally coming into our data set. Um, <clears throat> and then we also, uh, Taxonworks also built a Darwin Core importer. So I was able to import those specimens. And you can see them here, this Decker burn data set, um, 2,100 specimens were imported. Uh, via Darwin Core Archive very quickly um, once that tool was actually developed and I was involved in a lot of the planning and um, 
bug testing for that uh, importer. Um, so that that resulted in uh, thousands of specimens that were donated in 2018, but not accession until 2022. So four years uh, delay, but that's since been fixed. Um, so once we actually, so this is a bunch of different tools and I'm kind of skipping over them just for time here. But uh, over the past few years, Taxon Works has done a really good job of what I would think of as removing stream debris or I don't know, increasing the size of the channel. It's not a perfect metaphor, um, but uh, basically helping me as a collections manager move my uh, data faster to our, our database and then out to aggregators. Um, and importantly, it also built uh, a tool to help export our data and get it uh, to the Delta or out to the aggregator. So we can now export all our data in a Darwin Core archive, which we can uh, put as a link on the web, which can be Im imported by a bunch of different aggregators. Um, and importantly, TaxonWorks has also built in trace elements to let us track where all this data goes. Um, so we have not only collector global IDs, but we also have uh, unit global unique identifiers on every specimen. Um, and uh, if we look a little closer here, you can see those identifiers on every specimen. Not only does every specimen have a catalog number, but it has a global unique identifier. Um, we can add as many identifiers as we want. Um, and you can see here, you actually have a comparison between taxon works and what uh, gets sent to GBIF here, um, and then what is actually interpreted by GBIF. This is called GBIFference, which is another tool built in. Um, and you can see like, oh, GBIF actually excluded this for some reason. Um, so we should probably work on that. Like, why is this image not going out? Uh, why is preserved specimen altered to preserved underscore specimen? Things like that. So this is a really cool, uh, really cool tool built into taxon works. Um, you can see those global identifiers here. These are for people, and I'll get more into that in a little bit. So that's kind of a bigger picture of how our data is flowing out. Um, but let's look at one specimen um, to try to start to answer that original question I had, which was how quickly can individual specimens generate citations of a collection? Um, uh, so let's. Th this one specimen was collected. It's a tick. It was collected by myself um, uh, from my pant leg back in 2018. Um, you'll notice in Taxon Works, we actually have uh, three different people here. We've got Emily Struckoff, who identified it. We have myself, who, uh, and Derek Hennon, who collected it. And we all have our global unique orchids. Um, we've got a catalog number and a global unique identifier on that specimen. Um, and this is exported uh, through our Darwin Core exporter, goes out to GBIF. And you can see our global unique identifiers are associated with that on GBIF. But really, this is as far as the collections boat travels. I can't really go any farther um, and use it after I've done this image importer and transcriber tool, after I've used our exporter, um, used whatever our data management tools are. Um, I can't really go any farther. Um, so uh, honestly, when it comes to tools that I am using and helping to develop and uh, or contribute to as a, as a user, I think we've come a long way. There's still a few more things that we can do to sort of clean up this area of the ecosystem. Um, more importers are always great in different ways. Um, we've got, uh, we've integrated GUID management and creation into the software. This is great. Um, we need more tools to link persistent identifiers with objects. Um, I really would love to see more stuff coming back from uh, aggregators to us, but I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and more data validation and cleaning tools. That's, I mean, this data that's going down there is not always perfect, um, but that's another talk entirely. Um, but I'd like to spend the rest of my time talking about this part of the ecosystem. So we focus a lot on getting our data down this river into this part and then out to aggregators. Um, there's someone who's not muted, Debbie. I don't know who that is, but uh, if you could fix that. We'll figure it out. There now we, we need to unmute Tom. There we go. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about the rest of this. So once we get spec or data out to these aggregators, what happens next? I am as a collections manager who is uh, honestly overworked and uh, has too many jobs to do. Um, I have to justify my existence still to administrators. I have to talk about um, what our data is doing, why the higher admin needs to keep supporting collections, keep supporting our data um, and everything that we're doing. And so a lot of the ways we do this is with citations and metrics. Um, but 
at this point, at, at the point where I am at, I'm putting my data out here and just hoping that these aggregators do something with it um, that leads to these. Um, and so how do I follow the rain? How do I follow what is generating the rain in this kind of ocean? Um, again, not a perfect metaphor, but I, I think it kind of makes sense. How do I follow this uh, into the ocean? Um, so right now we have one method and this is, uh, we have a Google Scholar page that tracks, that I have to manually update somewhat, um, that tracks citations of papers that I have added there, which I know have used our specimens or have used the NHS Insight Collection. So I have to manually add those. And let's, let's look at this exactly what this means. Um, we have a specimen here that was uh, uh, identified or it was collected in 1906. Recently, it was databased and sent out from loan in 2021. It was returned and re-identified, updated on GBIF as of the 25th of March, 2022. Um, completely separate from me, uh, the paper was published in diversity. Um, he copied me and uh, he published this paper. He copied me on the email. And so I added that to a Google Scholar page. And so I get more citations and metrics. But these two processes are not linked. Um, pretty quickly, honestly, from digitization to citation, which is required for, um, for tracking of things, only about a year and two months. It required a physical loan. Um, he ignored local identifier, or this author ignored our local identifiers. He ignored the DOI that I provided him. Um, I don't know if this specimen was ever used previously because it doesn't have, didn't have a globally unique identifier. Um, it, this method, I can't really track individual specimens because they weren't used in this paper. Um, I only tracked about nine papers like this in 2022. Um, and I think honestly, if individual researchers cite uh, the DOI that we're providing from GBIF, this would help a lot more. Um, so before I talk about that, uh, I'd like to talk about, before I talk about the GBIF method, going back from here, um, there is, I can also add uh, citations from the aggregators that I send to. So we send IDIG bio, an INHS symbiota portal, and an INHS, or an a scan symbiota portal. Um, as well as GBIF, but I'll talk about that in a second. Um, each of these portals recommend that you cite the data. Um, IDIG Bio gives you a data set ID. I queried that data set idea, ID and I found one new paper, which was not new. It was already found by GBIF. Um, Symbiota, our INHS one, uh, doesn't actually give you anything unique to query. Um, so I queried INHS and the URL, which is recommended to be cited. I found nine records. Only one of them was related to the insect collection record. This is just with a Google Scholar search. Um, and I did the same with our scan portal. I queried scan bugs and INHS, and I only found two non-GBIF tracked insect collection literature records. So all these aggregators um, over the past 10 years have generated me 11 records, 11 new citations for our collection, as far as I can tell. Um, using the ways that they recommend that I cite them. Let's compare that to GBIF. Um, and also I will mention that, uh, I'll talk about this in a second. There are other, aggreg other aggregators that do this as well. GBIF provides a built-in citation tracking tool via download DOIs. So they have this nifty tool right here. And you can see that since we've started uploaded to GBIF, we've got 590 different citation, 91 different citations. 120 of these are new just this last year. And those numbers seem to be going up. As you can see in this chart here, this is still incomplete. Um, uh, just yesterday, you can actually see that uh, 14 occurrences were from us were downloaded yesterday. Um, actually, nope, that was this morning. Um, it was not even uh, a day ago. I can see real-time updates. Um, furthermore, I can actually go to Bionomia and track that individual specimen that I mentioned earlier and see how it's been used in other papers. Um, you can go to an individual DOI. You can actually look at the number of different places that have uh, cited the specimen. And so I can go back to this individual specimen model and watch as the specimen that I collected that one of the um, students, uh, grad students here at INHS identified, went out to GBIF, was cited in a DOI, and now I can use that for my administrators as proof of our usage. Um, so total time in this case was four years, 10 months, which is pretty dang good. Um, but I think uh, if we solve a whole bunch of issues, like, like let's talk about 
We can get rid of the tax and impediment, digitiz digitization funds. Uh, we can reduce a year in 10 months. Um, uh, this was going on during development of tax on works. And that took about eight months to build up the Darwin core ex exporter that was fixed. So we can remove another eight months. Um, hypothetically, there is no bottleneck now from uploading to downloading, so we can reduce that. Um, and we'll, we'll skip the publishing bottleneck. Um, but hypothetically, if I database or I collect and database a specimen in a day, uploaded to GBIF, um, it's downloaded the next day, um, you take a couple months to write and publish your paper, um, it's discovered in link via GBIF, it, we can get this down to six months. So new specimens can be generating citations in less than a year, which would be amazing. Um, only took a few issues to do. Um, so this, I think, is the future that collection managers need to aim for, which is we all we do is digitize, and then we get citations. We don't have to worry about a Google Scholar page. We don't have to worry about emailing people and asking them for papers. However, there are issues with the different aggregators doing this. So this is a great hypothetical model, but where does it fail? Right now, pretty much every other aggregator other than GBIF and one other one I'll mention in a second doesn't provide a DOI. So why would I be spending my time to digitize these specimens if they're not going somewhere that can actually cite them? As, as I've shown, current models are not letting us track the specimens and the papers that were that are using our specimens uh, in those other aggregators. Um, also, we can work on people actually letting us or citing that DOI and uh, sending those back to us. Um, if they're actually setting that deal wide, it's provided by GBIF, then that makes it super easy. Um, I have seen really, really bad examples of this. Um, uh, even if GBIF provides a DOI, uh, it doesn't always get cited. I've seen it be buried in materials and methods papers and the acknowledgements, um, supplemental files, which is annoying, but still doable and then completely stripped out, which I think is inexcusable. Um, so if we compare some of the common aggregators out there, only two of them provide DOI tracking. Um, the other collections, uh, the other aggregators out there don't yet. Um, and I will say there are reasons to update, upload to these other portals. Symbiota portals are often used by a very specific community. Um, and so you can query one of those and you get all the bee records or all the plant records from a certain region. Um, but they don't provide some of the other things that other aggregators are do doing. Um, and I think this is really disingenuous. It uh, it doesn't replenish the water table. If I go back to my original, original metaphor, um, I think publishers should start doing a lot more um, to provide uh, or to require data management plans. Um, I think saying data is on request from the author should be grounds for reje rejection, especially based on this recent paper that uh, very clearly showed that data is not available upon request. Um, that is the title of the article. That is the conclusion of the article. It's an excellent title. Um, and uh, I think if you strip out primary identifiers uh, and you don't have the verbatim data anywhere, then it's not repeatable and it's not uh, good science. Um, recently, we actually uh, published a paper based on specimens we recently digitized uh, that were part of a new accession we got in 2022. Um, and we managed to cite are these specimens and publish a paper in less than a year, uh, well, really close to a year afterwards. Um, and so it is doable, uh, it takes effort. Um, and I will say there are caveats. Um, I've recently talked with some of these aggregators and I know that building this infrastructure costs money and money is always an issue. Um, it takes money to register DOIs. It co apparently costs a significant amount of, amount of money to dedicate server time and space costs to storing these DOIs in perpetuity. Um, and it costs money to develop this data infrastructure in the in the beginning. Um, We're at time. Uh, so I'll wrap up here. But basically, uh, there are still some issues um, that I see with this whole method of just getting everything to the Delta um, without thinking about what's coming after that. Um, I have a lot of people to thank, uh, but I will stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Tommy. Lots to think about there. A um, lot. And Tommy, recently, Tommy's been leaping through hurdles of families getting sick and then sharing as, as we all do in our close relationships. So Tommy, we're glad you got better enough to be able to join us to do this. Thanks. I see comments in the chat too. You'll have to go back and, and follow through on that. And for those of you who saw my talk yesterday, 
um, we'd be happy to talk with you. And I know Tommy more about bionomia as well. And yes, let the water flow, Tommy. Marvelous. So uh, Michael did rejoin us. Michael, um, we're about to go into break. There's going to be two opportunities to expand on all of these ideas. One is the three minutes, uh, one slide. So Michael, you could maybe do the punchline in that session or in the unconference session as well. So we're hoping to work with you, Michael, at, in over the break to, to do that. And for those of you who uh, would like to continue that conversation or hear more from, from any of the speakers that can join us, or um, I see some folks, I see Samantha from, from uh, the symbiotic community. We would love to hear from you guys in those three minute one slide presentations for um, how you're sort of dealing with the ideas that have gone around. Uh, you're all welcome to propose that, just let us know. Um, so time for further conversation in those two places.